from the top of Australia are the coastal regions and swamplands of Papua New Guinea, a vast area of dangerous waters, coral reefs, huge rivers and jungle. This is the land of the long canoes. I've journeyed to this area several times to explore and stay with my friends in the villages. In part one of this film, Les Anwil and I landed at Daru, a small island off the coast. We collected our boat from the wharf, packed our gear and headed for the village of Kadawa. These coastal tribesmen trade with the Fly River people. They net giant barramundi and generally lead an easy, carefree life. For weeks we lived with the villagers, totally involved in their daily activities. Most of their supplies come from the sea. Crayfish are speared on the coral reefs and fish and prawns are easily caught. The men of Kadawa construct beautiful twin-masted double outrigger canoes for hunting and trading across the Torres Strait. We travelled with them as they hunted the massive marine turtles, living for days at a time on the big Motu Motu canoes. Towards the end of the dry season, we left the blue waters and sandy shores and motored up the mighty Fly River into a region where the coastal people never go, an eerie, wild world of swamps and jungles, the home of my friends the Suki, shy, stalwart tribesmen who take their food from the forest and hunt crocodiles for their skins with bow and arrow. Corner, a local trader, travels the rivers in his gargantuan diesel-powered canoe, named Bardi the Crocodile. With Corner in the Bardi, we intend to visit the remote tributaries of the Fly River. And then after many weeks, we'll journey east to Makapa village to stay with the Kamula people. And finally, we'll visit the magnificent Wawoi Falls on the edge of the highlands. Now, after days of preparation, we finally leave the Suki behind and head upstream. Progress is slow. The monsoons have already begun in the highlands. The river is rising and immediately I'm apprehensive. The strong currents are cutting into the banks, bringing down giant trees, a constant hazard. The huge logs bear down on us at every bend, slowly sinking below the surface as they become waterlogged. My worst fears are realised when a freak accident overturns the body, and for three days we live through sheer hell. One minute everything is fine, and then we're all thrown into the water, struggling to the surface through the tangled debris. After checking that no one is trapped below the surface, I swim to the dinghy and bring it alongside. Urgently, we begin salvaging any gear and food that we can before it floats off downriver. Corner hopefully rescues some sodden salt, but our mosquito nets are a higher priority in this malaria-ridden region. It's impossible to ascertain what's caused the upset, especially as this canoe has been used successfully on extensive journeys, even travelling between rivers in the open sea. The wheelhouse has to go. There's no way we can get Bardi upright again with an overload of superstructure. Fortunately, it's still early morning and we're able to get the most valuable camera and recording equipment into the dinghy. Petrol for the outboard is of vital importance now and we collect whatever we can as we drift with the current. The symbolic lucky crocodile designs along the side guaranteeing a safe journey are of little significance now. And as I struggle to remove the remains of the wheelhouse, the possibility of attack from a real crocodile is constantly in my mind.
For hours we drift with the current until we snag on a fallen tree near the bank at a bend in the river. After hours of toil and emotional strain, we're all exhausted. As the tide drops, we're able to roll Bardi into the upright position. It's an impossible place to camp, but we try to dry out our sleeping gear before the approaching storms soak everything again. Late in the afternoon, we're on the move once more. Bardi's diesel engine has seized, but we make some progress using the outboard. We travel late into the night, catching a few hours sleep in a small clearing. And early in the morning, we press on. Warmizi keeps the fire smouldering. The last of our matches are too damp to strike. At last, a welcome scene. These coconut trees mark the site of an old camp, and we stop to rest. Exhausted, we enjoy the luxury of fresh coconut milk. The heat and the humidity are unbearable. In the spells between the storms, I attempt to dry out my cameras and recording gear and check what is still operative. Fortunately, I had sufficient equipment packed in watertight containers to continue filming. The film that you've been watching for the last five minutes, I was able to salvage from water-damaged stock. A rainstorm puts out our fire. So Les makes sure the second time using one of our many flares. With food now in short supply, fish and coconuts top the menu. The monsoon build-up is a daily display. With the expedition abandoned, we decide to return at once to Burry Creek. It's a long, slow, depressing trip. The Suki people are overjoyed at our safe return and they put on the most unusual party I've ever attended. As the tide drops, fresh mud is collected, nobody misses out, it's pure fun and everyone is involved in the skylarking. Some of the men even end up with smouldering fire sticks packed into the mud on their heads. All day the fun goes on. The village dogs add to the pandemonium with their mournful howling.
By late afternoon, the utter confusion of the men subsides to the gentler merrymaking of the women. Even the village animals collect a coating of mud. After the excitement of our return, village life settles again into its harmonious pattern. I'm keen to practice the local methods of lighting fires. For the first, a bamboo sliver has a smouldering fire going in minutes. The other method entails rubbing the inner soft wood of a certain tree with a much harder wood. My friends are anxious that I never get caught in the jungle without fire to keep the mosquitoes at bay. And, strange as it sounds, in such a tropical climate, to keep warm during the frequent rain squalls. <laughs> With the monsoons imminent, the single men have decided that it's time to construct a new house on higher ground. In village society, no one gives orders. The house building decision is agreed upon after lengthy discussions and everyone assists. Lunch arrives. Long sticks of sugar cane. Soon, all the family groups are rebuilding, preparing for the coming wet season. <laughs> a gigantic tree floating down the river deserves a closer look, and three small boys have some fun showing off. Boys all over the world love to play exciting, sometimes dangerous games, and the youngsters here are no exception. These children of the jungle have no manufactured toys, but their very surroundings supply them with many diversions. These boys amuse themselves for a few minutes with a dangerous spider. Butterflies are a popular plaything for the babies. Such vivid, eye-catching colours. <laughs> Perfect for face painting. Hey, where did my butterfly go? Sprays of orchids, so valuable in many countries, are collected in the jungle for a game of tag. These mischievous boys put two very fearsome-looking creatures on my spare camera. It's all good fun, although this character has a vicious pair of nippers. The men are the hunters, and the boys learn how to use bow and arrows at an early age, with a tuft of cassowary feathers as their target.
more serious affair is this display of fighting arrows. Echidna quills held in place with a natural resin make a dangerous weapon. The tip is of carved cassowary bone. The older boys soon leave the security of the village and take their quest for food seriously. Deep in the jungle, they shape bows from split bamboo. A colony of flying foxes has settled upstream and they're keen to show it to me. Just like boys everywhere, they brag and show off to one another. At the same time, however, they are developing skills that are so essential to survival in the jungle. In the morning, we all set out, the young hunters eager to find the flying fox colony. We locate one lot high in the trees. The boys watch impatiently as the bats settle again. The flying foxes, being nocturnal, don't travel far and the boys scatter along the river's edge, taking up positions of advantage as the bats return to the trees. In their excitement to retrieve a wounded bat, some of the boys take to the water. But they're anxious to get back into that canoe, for everyone knows that big crocs lurk beneath flying fox colonies where the old and very young animals are easy pickings. Although they're obviously having a lot of fun, the boys are very conscious that they're hunting for food, not just for sport. <laughs> Tired but happy with the results of their efforts, the young hunters head for an open garden area to cook a meal. One of the boys has even been lucky enough to bag a Victoria crowned pigeon. These big birds are common along the rivers, but unfortunately, in the more heavily populated areas, they're becoming rare, mainly because they're considered to be the best meat in the jungle. This young flying fox, a newly acquired pet, is still protesting at its capture. I was surprised to see these young boys eating immature coconuts. Even the husk was devoured. It's only when the nuts mature that the skin is unpalatable. Finishing their meal of roasted flying fox, the boys design these curious kite-shaped toys and spend the rest of the afternoon showing off their handiwork before we head back to Buri Creek.
The staple food sago is normally collected in the swamps, but today a mature tree planted in the village many years ago is felled and the women shred the pith. The edible sago must now be separated from the pith. The preparation is slow and tedious. Water is pressed through the pith to extract the sago. The process is repeated with each full bag. The washed pith is discarded and at the end of the day the water is drained off leaving the edible sago in the bark trough. Every piece is collected for its valuable food. Stored in woven bags, it keeps for months. <laughs> Daily at first light, family groups leave the village to hunt and collect food. This is a rare prize, a giant catfish caught in a set gill net. Compared with the other species of catfish in the river, this one's enormous. Twice it's been attacked by predators. First, there are the teeth marks of a shark and more recently a crocodile. The shark had taken it on the back behind the dorsal fin and as it was recovering from that, a crocodile attacked it the teeth marks clearly visible on each side of its body. So after escaping the croc, it's ended up in the net and it'll be eaten by the villagers. <laughs> Traders introduced the gill net. This net is a shambles. Two whaler sharks have torn into it. I've often been told that sharks are never found in fresh water, but here we are, 80 kilometres from the salt water, and although the fly is still under tidal influence, the water is fresh. Surprisingly, the people here will not eat the sharks, treating them as curiosities. Prawns, however, are always popular, and this man is catching them in the traditional way. First, he chops up a white ant's nest for bait, and according to the locals, the prawns enter the bag, have a great feed, and then retire under the leaves at the bottom of the bag. Every hour or so, the bag is retrieved and emptied of prawns. The traditional hairstyles favoured by the young women would be highly fashionable in our Western society. The expected monsoon has not arrived and the swamps are now lower than any of the tribesmen can remember. So the women head for the open marshes looking for fish marooned in the shrinking pools. <laughs> hey! 
and what is normally a broad expanse of water has been reduced to a few pools literally teeming with life. The women are ecstatic. Never have they seen so many fish an easy prey. The lack of oxygen has forced the fish to the surface, but in their panic to elude capture, they soon disappear under the reeds. What a feast. Everyone in the village will eat well tonight. And so we leave the women with their bundles of fish and join the men who have spent the morning hunting cassowary. These huge birds are incredibly heavy, so they're plucked and gutted before being carried back to the canoes. The main feathers are singed off. The sight of so much food can't be resisted and the men have a jungle barbecue. It'll be late in the day when we reach the village. The men bring down a palm and we feast on the soft inner leaves. We're all excessively thirsty and the pith is refreshing, sweet but rather tasteless, like young celery. Long distances are covered in search of game. Pig and cassowary, most sought after for their rich meat, live deep in the undergrowth. Smaller creatures such as cuscus add a variation to that diet. Usually the men capture these animals alive and keep them in cages to be eaten on special occasions. To me, the cuscus is delightful with its appealing little face, but the hunters only see food. In desperation, the creature jumps and, unable to reach another tree, lands in the lower limbs. The Cuscus has an extraordinary ability to leap great distances to elude capture, and this time a mighty effort saves this animal's life as it takes off into a nearby thicket.
and so the various hunting parties arrive home, some with very little to show for their efforts, others with sufficient to share with all. In their society, everyone is guaranteed some food. A bush wallaby is a valuable catch. As well as being a favoured meat, the skin is used on ceremonial drums. The stretched skin dries quickly in the heat and is ready for use the same day. <laughs> like all village activities, repairing a drum is a community project. As the job proceeds, one of the workers prepares for smoker. The black twist tobacco, a popular trading item, produces a powerful cigarette of mammoth proportions to be shared all round. Finally, the drum is tuned with lumps of beeswax, moulded and positioned until the desired resonance is achieved. But it's time for us to leave, and everyone gathers around for our farewell. I'm sorry to be leaving the friends who have looked after us, but I'm looking forward to renewing my acquaintance with the tribesmen further east. Returning to Daru, we fly out to the Aramira River and set off on a long canoe trip to the villages of the Kamula. I've brought my outboard with me on the plane to make this journey easier. But in the shallow swamplands, it's back to paddle power. A drink of clean, fresh water is welcomed after the arduous journey. <laughs> Until recently, the Kamula were ferocious warriors, and they're still respected for their hunting and dancing skills. Throughout the dry season, they spend months in the bush, returning to the main village at the beginning of the wet. Every man possesses an awesome array of arrows. The iron is a recent acquisition. The backs of the men are mottled with broken skin, healing burns inflicted during ritual ceremonies. Yeye, Ye, a tribal leader, proudly shows me his most recent burns from a ceremony three weeks ago. Before we leave Makapa, we're to witness this extraordinary event as the burns are inflicted. 
The kamula, like the suki, are completely at home in the jungle. Today, they're after wild pig. The women have found a jungle fowl's nest. The bird makes this huge mound to incubate her eggs, which can be anywhere in the decaying litter. The women persevere until they find some. Such large eggs are a rare treat. There are signs of pigs ahead, and cautiously the men investigate. A big boar is hiding in the undergrowth. It dies quickly from loss of blood. Attempts are made to carry it back to the village, but the beast is too heavy and has to be butchered on the spot. The women carry the excessively heavy loads of pork. Such is the law of the tribe, for the men must be ready at all times with their weapons. Progress through the jungle is easier when we reach a well-defined trail, the main thoroughfare between villages, which is also used to get newly constructed canoes down to the water. On our return to Makapa, we're in for a surprise. Everyone has gathered in the longhouse for a night of song and dance. The festivities have been arranged to celebrate our visit. It's their way of socialising and having fun. The women dance together bouncing their way around the longhouse until the floor vibrates. There's no age barrier. The young and the old all dance together, obviously enjoying themselves. The villagers who are not performing sit watching and chatting. This close social contact maintains harmony within the tribe. The women stop dancing when told that the men are approaching the longhouse. These men have spent the afternoon in the jungle decorating their bodies. They enter the building as the sky darkens in the west. The ritual begins as the men chant about their land, their experiences and their travels within their tribal territory. An elder incites the singers with specially prepared drops of molten resin. Tonight, it's only a light-hearted social affair and the burning is mild. The more intent the singers become, the more severe is the burning. At times, when these rituals continue through the night, the shoulders and the arms of the tribesmen are covered with blisters. These ceremonies are important social occasions and they maintain a strength and unity among the three Kabula villages. And finally, 
the most spectacular show of all, the Hornbill Bird Dance, a fantastic display of vibrant colours and tassels designed to thrill and entertain. Twenty men worked all day to ensure that the performers are dressed to perfection. Although we're tired from our long day in the jungle, we stay on and until late into the night, enjoying the spectacle and joining the Kamula social life. House construction is now a top priority. Sago palm leaves, overlapped and pinned, replace last season's thatch. This is the single men's hut and they're repairing the sections that have rotted. The torrential rains finally arrive. For the next six months, storms will sweep across the country almost daily. The vast jungle will become a quagmire. The rivers will flood and the swamps overflow as the people huddle around their fires waiting for the rain to stop so that they can foray out in their ceaseless quest for food. We head back down the river to Balimo and fly out to a recently installed airstrip on the edge of the highlands. We've heard of a most spectacular sight, the Wawoi Falls. As the local tribesmen guide us down through the luxuriant undergrowth, the sky is clear and we stand spellbound at the awesome sight and sound of the wonder before us. Locked away in the wilderness, the falls have been seen by few Europeans. I wonder at such powerful beauty. It's the most spectacular sight I've ever seen. For an hour or two, we relax in this peaceful mountain retreat. But time is running out, and after months in the wilderness, we begin the long journey back to Australia. And I know that this will not be my last visit to this wild and exotic land. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,